Hi, I'm Terry, and I'm a first grade teacher. And I'm Sarah, and I'm a writer. And this is our podcast, Reading During Recess. Today we'll be talking about Judy Bloom's novel, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. For those of you who haven't read ever or in a long time, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. We're going to give you guys a little summary. The book begins with a prayer that Margaret shares with God. I don't think prayer is exactly the right word, but Margaret has these frequent kind of conversations with God, one-sided conversations with God. And um, she starts off the book saying, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. We're moving today. I'm so scared, God. I've never lived anywhere but here. Suppose I hate my new school. Suppose everyone there hates me. Please help me, God. Don't let New Jersey be too horrible. Thank you. I'm so sorry, Margaret. I have bad news for you about New Jersey. (laughs) No offense, New Jersey. But a little bit. So Margaret is referencing the move her family's about to make from Manhattan to the New Jersey suburbs. And Margaret uh, is an 11-year-old sixth grader who we get to know very well over the course of the book. Yes, she's the first person narrator of this book, and she kind of takes us through all the trials and tribulations of puberty. Like we didn't already do it once. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) So Margaret moves in and immediately meets Nancy Wheeler, which is also (laughs) the name of one of the characters in Stranger Things, so that's funny. They fully ripped that. Yeah. Like, 100%. But you know what's funny, though, is when I took creative writing in college, I named, like, every character after, in part, like, either first or last name, after the characters from the 90s movie Scream, or their actors. (laughs) Oh, man. So I get it. I totally get it. Duff Brothers, or whatever your name is. Yeah, Duffer Brothers, maybe? Duffer Brothers, yep. Yeah, so Nancy is Margaret's neighbor, and she is very friendly immediately befriends Margaret. Unfortunately, she's also kind of rude, but what are you going to do? Margaret starts the sixth grade. Their sixth grade teacher is a young, nervous man named Mr. Benedict, who I believe it's his first year teaching, right, Terry? It is. Um, And damn, he he comes off very uncomfortable almost immediately. Yeah. And that is a terrible idea. Like, you can't show weakness to sixth graders. Yeah. They will shred you like cheese. (laughs) Yeah, they're also all kind of confused because they're like, why is our teacher a man? Yeah, I guess that was less common in the 70s when this book was written. But they were deeply shaken. And he gives them this weird little questionnaire to fill out. And the last question on there is, or prompt, is I think male teachers are blank. Which is like very odd and self (laughs) thing to like what <laughs> you're also just really opening yourself up to getting your feelings hurt yeah for sure it's like don't ask questions that you don't want the answer to you know what i'm saying yeah mr benedict is a a character who pops up throughout the book usually nervously we never get to know him that well no we don't it's interesting i thought we were going to get more of his deal because he's very interested in the ongoing kind of theme of the book which is mark or one of the themes of the book which is Margaret's ongoing battle with the concept of religion. And I sort of thought that was like a Chekhov's gun thing. He was like, I am very excited to hear about like your take on religion. And then we never learn why. Like I thought we were going to get a little something from him. So uh, the reason religion is such like an interesting part or the lack thereof is such an interesting part of Margaret's life is because her mother was Christian and her father is Jewish. They're very pointedly raising her without religion. Their take is that if she decides she wants to be part of any religious group, that that's something that she'll decide when she's older. And this causes a lot of conflict for her because all of her friends are either part of the YMCA or the Jewish Community Center. And Margaret feels sort of uncertain about where she can, quote, find God, because she clearly has a special relationship with this entity, but she doesn't really know the, quote unquote, correct way, I guess, to go about enhancing it what would you say yeah and i think that also is exacerbated by the fact that people keep asking her what her religious affiliation is which is kind of invasive and weird but yeah what (laughs) is that a thing in the 70s you could go up to people and ask that i guess so and when she tells like her new group of friends that she has no religion they're like how positively neat (laughs) 
I'm like, that's cute. <laughs> they like it. They're jazzed about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a big conflict in the family because, as I said, her her dad is Jewish and her mother is or was Christian, and uh, her grandparents on her mother's side are vehemently uh, or were vehemently opposed to their marriage and they actually wound up eloping. And while she's very, well, Margaret is very close with her grandmother on her father's side, her dad's mother. She has nothing to do and has never met her mother's parents. Yeah. So grandma Sylvia is her Jewish grandmother who is a boss. I love her. (laughs) Sylvia slaps. Sylvia is, like, distressed that they're moving from the city. She's like, how are you going to get your deli meats? A valid question. (laughs) Yeah. She sends Margaret, like, sweaters that have little, that she made herself, that have, like, little tags in them that say, like, made expressly by Grandma Sylvia or something like that. And that is so cool. And I want one. I know. It's really cute. Yeah. So her maternal grandparents, however, are not really in the picture. They come for one awkward visit during the book and then leave after an argument with Margaret's parents about Christianity. And so this strife between the family is definitely a major source of conflict in the book. So yes, so Margaret has just arrived. She's started at this new school. Uh, She's friends with Nancy and she joins Nancy's secret, in quotes, club, along with those three other girls their names are nancy Janie, and gretchen and after some deliberation on what their name should be they decide on pts preteen sensations which is amazing that is such a good name it it does sound like kind of like the start of post-traumatic stress disorder but like yeah other than that i think it's an awesome name yeah i did think it sounded a little medical i was like it's like ptsd and pms (laughs) Uh, But they come up with all these, this great list of rules. They decide that all the members have to wear bras. They have to keep a rotating list of boys that they have crushes on. So I think the idea is in theory that it will change, which is fair, you know, but this is something that they're going to check up on. Like they expect to see it updated and they have to, they absolutely must tell each other when they get their first period. Yes. And they also do some exercises to help them grow boobs. (laughs) One of which they they do the exercise while repeating like the mantra, I must, I must increase my bust. Yes, which works. That's that's what happened to me. (laughs) You know, what's so funny is I feel like many girls can like pinpoint this weird thing they were told about their boobs growing up. Like my distinct memory is one from the Alice books where uh, and we will, of course, get into the Alice books in future episodes, but where. One of the girls said that, like, if you could hold a pencil, I think it's underneath. Or I think it's between your boobs. Between. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Between your boobs, then you had big boobs. And I remember, I was like, I read that, and I was like, well, now I have to go find a pencil. Like, (laughs) like, you can't just, like, say these things and not expect me to internalize and remember this, like, for the rest of my life. So I guarantee you that some girl back in the 70s read Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, and started doing bust exercises Mm -hmm. and um regrettably they don't seem to be working for margaret just buy a bra it is part of the rules yeah she does buy a bra it's weird also because the next meeting they have nancy has to like feel strap underneath their clothes to confirm that they're all wearing bras which to me just seems like very invasive (laughs) where's the trust she Um, also she's very um I don't like the word bossy, but she she's a little controlling. She tells Margaret that she, on the first day, she's like, you have to wear loafers without socks. And this is like an ongoing thing for her. She's like, I swear to God, like, do not wear socks with your loafers. Or you can't be part of the club. Yeah. Like, Nancy. Yeah, Nancy's kind of rude. Um, she is. I was like, I'm not going to, like, listen to smack from someone who's wearing loafers. I know it's 1970, but seriously. <laughs> yeah, that actually reminds me. I want to find the exact quote of something rude that she says. Hold on. <laughs> I do love, she says, I want you to join my secret club. And if you're wearing socks, the other kids might not want you. <laughs> like, I sincerely doubt Janie or Gretchen would have said anything, but. I know. Nancy has a lot way of. To, way to pass the buck, Nancy. <laughs> On the first day that Margaret has moved to this new neighborhood, Nancy comes over and invites her to come play in the sprinkler. And so Margaret has to borrow a swimsuit from Nancy. 
And Margaret says, Nancy gave me the creeps the way she sat on her bed and watched me. I left my polo on until the last possible second. I wasn't about to let her see I wasn't growing yet. That was my business. Oh, you're still flat, Nancy laughed. Not exactly, I said, pretending to be very cool. I'm small boned is all. <laughs> I'm growing oh. already, Nancy said, sticking her chest way out. In a few years, I'm going to look like one of those girls in Playboy. Well, I didn't think so, but I didn't say anything. My father gets Playboy, and I've seen those girls in the middle. Nancy looked like she had a long way to go. God damn. Margaret with the zingers. I know. Is that a thing that people's dads got Playboy, and it was like a known fact? I guess so. I would have thought that that would be something one would keep under wraps. Well, you know, maybe it was for the interviews, Terry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He reads them for the articles. Yeah. Please. <laughs> so they're they're in the secret club. Time to discuss Philip Leroy. Mm -hmm. Great name. So these boy books that they have prominently feature Philip Leroy. He's number one in pretty much everyone's book because apparently he's the cutest boy in their grade. But he does seem boring. Extremely so. And also, I would really, really, really like to know what a cute sixth grade boy looked like in 1970. Because I can tell you what a cute sixth grade boy looked like in 2007. They had that, like, remember the haircut that, like, flipped down, like, kind of curled out at the bottom? Yeah, yeah. So it looked like an inside-out umbrella. Mm hmm And I just want to know what the standards were. Yeah, I'm imagining, Ooh. like, Greg from the Brady Bunch, so. <laughs> uh, true. Yeah, so Margaret regularly chats informally with God. There's lots of short sections throughout the book that are italicized that are, like, her her conversations with God, and he becomes sort of like a dear diary figure and also someone that she hopes will help grant her wishes, like she wishes for boobs and for her period and stuff. And she also develops a crush on an older boy who is inexplicably named Moose. We never find out why he's called that, but he cuts their family's lawn. And yeah, she's embarrassed to admit that she has a crush on him. Um, so she just says that Philip Leroy is her crush, but in reality, it's more Moose. It's because Moose is the friend of Nancy's older brother, mm -hmm. um, and she believes them to be animals. <laughs> <laughs> so Margaret is a little bit embarrassed by her, her bad reputation crush. Yes. So Margaret's school life, back to Mr. Benedict... He's assigned the students a year-long project on something that they're interested in, and Margaret decides that she's going to learn about religion and ultimately make the decision if she wants to be Jewish or Christian. So she goes to temple with her grandma, and her grandma's very excited about this. She says, like, I always knew you were a Jewish girl. She goes to two different Christian churches with her friends, you know, and, and looks for God in all of these places but ultimately feels like she doesn't have a connection to him in the context of any of these single religions and really feels close to him only when she's talking to him one-on-one -on -one. nancy goes away for a weekend and sends margaret a postcard that just has three words on it in all caps it says i got it exclamation point meaning that she got her first period and so this, of course, sends Margaret into a tailspin because she becomes increasingly concerned that she's going to be the last girl in her friend group to get her period. But in an interesting twist, when mm -hmm. Margaret goes to New York for a day with Nancy's family, Nancy gets her first period for real. And she admits that it's her first time and that she lied when she said she got it earlier. And Margaret is understandably confused and like <laughs> weirded out <laughs> she's like i mean damn i want my period too but i didn't lie about it that's a good revealing moment about nancy but... sort of her fall from grace moment in yeah. margaret's eyes yeah. like i think margaret was always a little bit put off by some of nancy's like blunt approach to their friendship but i think that this was a moment where she's like i can't <laughs> yeah. deal with this <laughs> So uh, later on, a little bit in the school year, Margaret gets assigned to do a group project with Philip Leroy, a resident sixth grade hottie, and a girl named Laura Danker, who Margaret and the rest of the girls in the class all seem to dislike because she's kind of developing before the rest of them, and there have been a lot of nasty rumors circulating around her. 
In particular, one that Laura goes behind the A and P with boys, like Moose, and will let them do whatever they want. Laura is a sort of a social pariah because of her body, which is very sad. It is very sad, and the the really loathing way that they talk about her almost as if they feel like her perceived sluttiness is like contagious you know Mm -hmm. the other girls don't even want to spend time with her it's very sad you know they're all out here trying to increase their bust Mm -hmm. and praying to god that they get their period soon but but at the same time like body shaming this girl who happens to have a bust you know So during the group project that Margaret does with Laura and Philip, to use a technical term, Margaret acts like a little bitch. She (laughs) makes a mistake. She accidentally like plagiarizes the encyclopedia, which I guess is how you did plagiarism in 1970. And when Laura calls her out, Margaret gets unnecessarily defensive and accuses Laura of going behind the A&P with Moose. And basically, you know, being a slut. And Laura is hurt and confused and is like, what are you talking about? You know, starts crying. And then Margaret offers um, a not very good apology, but a kind of apology. And she feels guilty. So then she follows Nancy after school. And Nancy's going to confession at her Catholic church. And Margaret, I guess, is like overwhelmed with shame and guilt and also curiosity about catholicism and so she also can i just say catholicism is a great way to feel worse if you are someone who is overwhelmed by shame and guilt at any point in life (laughs) yeah she's really they will not help you with that (laughs) yeah so margaret goes into the little confession booth i'm sure there's a technical term but i'm not catholic so i don't know it and the priest starts talking to her and margaret's like god (laughs) is that you (laughs) margaret is none too bright which is why she has to plagiarize the encyclopedia yeah um and then margaret runs away because she's like i don't know what i'm doing and she doesn't know what confession is and so she runs away but um she still regrets hurting laura and believing the rumors and ultimately, at the the end of the novel, she confronts Moose about starting the rumor, and he has no idea what she's talking about and tells her not to believe everything she hears, and it is, again, reinforced that Nancy is a little liar and a little potster and a gossip monger and all those things that someone can be. But all is not lost because Margaret gets her period! Yes. Congratulations. Blow a little air horn. (laughs) Margaret gets her period. She's thrilled. She's, I guess, the second or third one to get her period. She's not the last one. And that's like a big thing for her out of her friend group and kind of reinforces to her that she is normal and developing normally. And for a girl whose whole concern throughout this book has been like normalcy, you know, in regard to religion and her body, this is a very pivotal, comforting moment. Yes. And plus the names of the pads that she uses are Teenage Softies, which is hilarious. Yeah. Love a Teenage softy. Me crying in class because someone hurt my feelings, Teenage softy. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about why I wanted to do an episode about this book. So it obviously is like a pretty iconic, famous part of the... Uh, children's and middle grade slash YA canon. I remember hearing a lot about it, a lot of controversy about it when I was a kid because it's like Mm -hmm. consistently been a very challenged book by libraries and parents because of its content, the way it talks about periods and the way it talks about religion. And I was actually surprised when I read it how tame it was, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, it's very... Yeah, I was too. I thought that... And it... I've read Judy Bloom books that are a little bit less tame, so I sort of thought it was going to go that route. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's really, like, it doesn't really address sex much at all. Yeah, the language is very G-rated, so it's um, it's funny to me that it's, like, it was, especially at the time when it was pu- published in 1970, that it was so controversial because it really 
I mean, compared even to like a lot of the books that I read as a teenager, it's very tame. Mm -hmm. But yeah, one of the other reasons I wanted to talk about it is because I know it was a very important book for a lot of people who are like my mom's age, you know, anytime Mm -hmm. I talk to women who are like over the age of 50 about our podcast, they're like, oh my God. The big book when I was a kid was, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. You have to talk about that. (laughs) Oh, we got you. So I'd actually never read the book before for this podcast. Me neither. I think I kind of... But I knew about it. I mean, it's probably one of the most famous book titles Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, of all time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been... We'll talk more about it, but, you know, it's been referenced by everything from The Simpsons to uh, Marvel. Right. Yeah. So I knew about it, but I never read it when I was a kid, I think, because I was like a little bit embarrassed to read it because I knew that it like had so much cultural baggage and I thought that it was an inappropriate book and so Mm -hmm. um but it's really not that inappropriate at all (laughs) not in the slightest (laughs) it's very sweet really yeah it is a very sweet book all right so let's talk a little bit about the author because Judy Bloom is obviously an icon in children's literature but of course you guys have all heard of Judy Bloom easily one of the most prolific kids and YA authors of the last century. And I <laughs> I can't help noticing that every kid's book written between 1960 and 2000 that wasn't written by Beverly Cleary or Lois Lowry is written by Judy Bloom. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, those three ladies dominated the scene. They had YA by the neck. <laughs> and I'm not sorry. No. So Judy Bloom was born in 1938 in New Jersey and spent her childhood reading and creating stories in her head. And she graduated from NYU in 1960, became a wife and mother, and then began writing while her kids were in nursery school. She was also taking some uh, adult classes, I guess, like at NYU, uh, writing classes while she was while she was starting to write her first books, which I thought was very sweet. The Mm -hmm. idea of continued education in adulthood, especially at a time period, you know, when you're a wife and mother. But this would have been in 69, Mm -hmm. but that she would have made a point to pursue this. So she published her first book, The One in the Middle is the Green Kangaroo, in 1969. And then over the next decade published a lot of big name books, uh, Iggy's House, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, otherwise known as Sheila the Great, Blubber and Freckle Juice. Yes, and she published Forever in 1975, a novel that was frequently banned for portraying teen sex as normal and not resulting in death. (laughs) Yeah, which is a very dangerous thing to let kids know, that they will not immediately die if they had sex. She actually wrote that book because her daughter apparently came home and said that, essentially, she's like, I just want to read a book where, you know, teens have sex and then don't die. I want to know what these books were. Yeah. I haven't read any of these teen sex death books, but please give me recommendations. So sexuality was a common theme for her books, which tackled a lot of complex topics like puberty, masturbation, sex, death, etc. And her books faced a lot of controversy, especially in the 1980s. Thanks, Reagan. And so this began Bloom's fight against censorship and she's still involved with the national coalition against censorship today so overall bloom has written 31 books most of them children's books and has received over 90 literary awards including three lifetime achievement awards and her books are still hugely popular today they've been printed in over 30 languages and you know years later this book was written in 1970 we're talking about it 50 years later in 2021 Her books are still considered groundbreaking for their honest and heartfelt portrayals of childhood and young adulthood. Yeah, so just in terms of general impressions of the book, I, like I said, was surprised that it was so controversial and also was surprised um, how much religion was a central conflict in the book. I kind of expected puberty to be more of a central Mm -hmm. conflict. Me too. I thought the title was just to be silly. I did not think that it was going to be an ongoing thing. The title to me and also like the kind of the reputation around the book is it it being about this teenage strife that's very difficult. I really expected the book to be kind of tortured in a way. And it's actually surprisingly funny and light. You know, a lot Mm -hmm. of the there's a lot of humor throughout the book. 
So now it's time for a segment that may be a recurring segment, which I <laughs> would like to title, Why Do Girls in YA Books Want Their Period So Badly? Question mark. I cannot relate. And I don't get it because they're written by women. Is this like, <laughs> was this a thing that I, is I, like, what am I missing here? Is this a generational difference? Yeah, I guess I can totally relate to the feeling of wanting to be normal and want to feel like your body is normal mm-hmm. and things are progressing as they should. But also I feel like I was pretty clear-eyed about the fact that having a period was going to be a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. And, and I was right about that. And in the uterus. <laughs> and Primarily lots, in the uterus. Yeah. <laughs> but I kind of love that there's so many books about it, though, because it is such a... I don't know if it's a chicken or the egg thing. Like... Is it written about so much because it is like a hugely pivotal point in our lives? Or do we feel like it's this hugely pivotal point in our lives because we've all been reading about it, you know, from the moment we started reading J14 and YA novels? Where did this come from? But I can tell you that everybody I know who has had a period does remember very distinctly the time and place of the first one. Yes, Terry. Um, Would you like to tell us a little bit more (laughs) about your personal experience? Because I love this story. Thank you for letting me talk about this on the podcast, Sarah. This is very important to me. Like I said, everybody remembers when and where. I got my first period at a bowling alley called Wayne's Lanes in Waynesboro, Virginia. I thought I was dying, but that didn't, like, stop me or anything. I was like, well, I I was there on a summer camp trip like I was there with a whole bunch of other like eighth graders this and is I was a nightmare like, oh it is a nightmare I was like but I'm not gonna tell anyone I was like so I guess I'll just die this is a problem for later like maybe a few hours later but I will always remember Wayne's Lanes for that Wayne's Lanes has since burned to the ground <laughs> I am not gonna say that the two ex- the two things are related but I'm also gonna say I'm not gonna say that they're not related is what I'm saying like maybe correlation does equal causation I got my period there. Wayne's Lanes is now ashes. So yeah, that was my experience. I think about it often and I will never forget. (laughs) R.I.P. Wayne's Lanes, you were a pretty shitty bowling alley. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. Thank you for letting me share that with you, listeners. Um, That actually reminds me that one of the early suggested names for this podcast when we were brainstorming names before we landed on reading during recess, my sister suggested, are you there, listeners? It's me, a <laughs> podcaster. <laughs> oh, I loved that. I'm s- So when we make stickers, we've said it before, we're going to come back to all of these amazing names you missed out on. Yes. Shout out to Kate, <laughs> uh, the sister in question, because <laughs> that name is amazing. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to now draw our attention to what are some of the most 70s moments in this book, because like we said, I think that the book actually reads remarkably well for a contemporary audience. I think that Margaret's voice and a lot of the things that she's concerned about still feel very relatable to young girls today, but there are some (laughs) moments where it is very clear that you're reading a book that was written in 19... You are pulled straight back, like, so hard. It's like someone grabbed the the bell bottom on your pants and just (laughs) yanked (laughs) yeah so one of those moments is in the language that's used in the book like the insults that the kids use to talk about each (laughs) other one of my favorites is drip as an adjective for like a boring person i guess i love that i want to bring it back or a loser Mm -hmm. okay i'll say this though sarah heads up when i was in sixth grade i was being picked on by a kid and i called him a drip in retaliation and this might surprise you but it did make things worse for me (laughs) obviously i heard that word from these books like i got it from probably judy bloom or beverly cleary Mm -hmm. or one of these women and it wound up being devastating for my social standing which was already really low (laughs) so yeah i would advise you to be careful when you try to bring back those oldies but goodies yeah another one that i love is um what a scream what a scream (laughs) yeah i cannot picture a child saying that i would like you to bring it back though both of us work with either young adults or children and i think you and i have a lot of influence and i think that we can 
make this a thing. Yeah. I'll start calling my students drips and see yeah. how it goes over. <laughs> <laughs> Another very 70s moment of the book is when Margaret and her whole class are invited to a supper party. Which is apparently like a very pivotal moment. I think it's kind of akin to boy girl birthday parties. Like, yeah, you know, but do you eat there? So is that what makes it a supper party? I guess so. So what makes it different than like a regular birthday party, I guess, is that you eat dinner there, which is like kind of an adult thing to do. Um, Yeah, it's like a dinner party. Yeah. Um, You dress very nice. The boys are wearing, like, suits. And also they throw food on the ceiling, so, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of every supper party. Yeah. Um, And they also play tween games, like, spin the bottle. Spin the bottle. Mm -hmm. A classic. Okay, please tell us, like, did any of you ever play spin the bottle? Like, is that real? I've never met a living person my age who's played spin the bottle. Me neither. Also, if any of you would like to play spin the bottle, come to my house anytime. My address (laughs) is... If you're vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I've seen, have you seen those stickers that are like, I got vaccinated to hug my mom or to like to do this? Please. Can we? I got vaccinated to play spin the bottle. But seriously, if any of you actually played it, please let us know. I'm so interested. Also, like uh, seven minutes in heaven mm-hmm. or whatever. The one where you go into a closet with somebody for an amount of time. Again, is this real? Did any of you do this? I, it didn't happen to me. (laughs) No, did not. (laughs) There's also a class square dance that the kids are, like, genuinely excited about, which I guess is how you know this happened in the 70s. I, I don't know. We did class dances, but they're, they're excited for the, for it to be a square dance, you know? Mm -hmm. This is a thing they dress up for. It's not, like, a joke between them. Yeah, so... On the topic of the book being kind of surprisingly cute and funny, I just wanted to share one of my favorite moments. So in chapter six, Mr. Benedict calls Margaret to his desk and wants to know a little bit more about why she wrote down that she hates religious holidays. And he says, you must have had a reason. You can tell me. It's confidential. I raised my right eyebrow at Mr. Benedict. I can do that really good. Raise one without the other. I can do it whenever I can't think of anything to say. People notice it right away. Some people actually ask me how to do it. They forget what we were talking about and concentrate on my right eyebrow. I don't know exactly how to do it. What I do is think about it and the eyebrow goes up. I can't do it with my left. Only my right. (laughs) Which I just love because it's like a great example of how kids think and how they just, I don't know, go off on these tangents and fixate on these stream of consciousness. Oh, man. Like, not what we're talking about, but she's like... I love that when she doesn't know what to say, she just raises her eyebrow. Like, it's like this really special skill. So another favorite part of the book was when Mr. Benedict reminds the class that they need to come up with a topic for their individual projects. And Margaret says, I thought a lot about it, but I didn't know anything meaningful that I was willing to share with Mr. Benedict. I mean, I couldn't very well come up with a year-long study about bras and what goes in them. (laughs) Not with that attitude. I just love and what goes in them. Like, as if you might put, like, I don't know, (laughs) something else in them. You might. She's funny. I love Margaret. I know. She's a silly little goose. She also, at one point, so this is actually, it's the introduction of Nancy, He was just immediately very confident and a little rude. Chapter two starts, We hadn't been in the new house more than an hour when the doorbell rang. I answered it. It was this girl in a bathing suit. Hi, she said. I'm Nancy Wheeler. The real estate agent sent out a sheet on you. So I know you're Margaret and you're in the sixth grade. So am I. I wondered what else she knew. (laughs) I just think it's such a funny... Like, (laughs) ominous aside, you know? What else does this girl know? First of all... Plot twist, Nancy is omnipotent. <laughs> yeah. This is, I guess, another part of the book that to me feels very um, dated. Is is this something that happened where real estate agents would send out fact sheets <gasps> about families that moved into the Do suburbs? No. Isn't that odd? Is that allowed? <laughs> I mean, I assume there's, like, parent involvement there, but it's very strange. 
And um, then I love that Nancy, another line for uh, the very 70s section, Nancy says, it's plenty hot, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so silly. And Margaret says, yes, I agreed. She was taller than me and had bouncy hair, the kind I'm hoping to grow. Her nose turned up so much I could look right into her nostrils. <laughs> Margaret has zingers of her own. Yeah, that's a, that's one of the things that I feel like Judy Bloom does really well is capture the voice of kids and fixating on like these small funny details that are something that an adult would not say. Mhm. <laughs> Speaking of the real estate agent sending out a fact sheet on this new family moving to the suburbs. It got me thinking about how the suburbs are such an important part of this book and such an important part of a lot of Judy Bloom's books, actually. Like, it's a, it's a topic that's explored more in Iggy's House, which is another book that Judy Bloom wrote about a Black family that moves to a uh, white suburb and experiences racism. I also thought it was relevant because these suburbs are so white that the people there can't even conceive of the idea that someone might not be Christian or Jewish, you know? Mm -hmm. They're like, those are the two options that a person can yeah. be. And so you have to be one or the other. And the racial segregation of American suburbs is obviously a very important and I think under-discussed aspect of our recent history. So if you are interested in learning more about this, I was reading some articles about this. I read one in particular from smithsonianmagazine.com called The Racial Segregation of American Cities Was Anything But Accidental. So Richard Rothstein has written a book called The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. And so he's a research associate at the Economic Policy Institute, and his book is really trying to flip the idea that the state of racial organization in American cities is just a result of individual prejudices. And he talks about all of the housing policies that created these majority white suburbs and majority minority, quote unquote, inner city areas. And he talks about how when the civilian housing industry picked up in the 1950s, the federal government subsidized mass production to builders to create suburbs on condition that the homes in those suburbs be only sold to whites and no African Americans were permitted to buy them, and the FHA, FHA often added an additional condition requiring that every deed in a home on those subdivisions prohibit resale to African Americans. And the reason why this is important, or one of the reasons why this is important, is that it obviously has really long-standing ramifications for mm -hmm. the wealth divide in our country. The result today is that African-American average incomes are about 60% of white incomes, but African-Americans average wealth is about 5% of white wealth. And this enormous difference is almost entirely attributable to the unconstitutional federal housing policy in the mid-20th century, where basically white families were able to own homes in nice areas and black families were not. And it's about everything. I mean, think about our schools. Yep our school systems, the way counties are divided. So that was just one aspect of this book that I felt like I, I just couldn't stop thinking about it because it really is a book kind of about the creation of the American suburbs. I mean, like Margaret's family leaves New York City to move to the suburbs. And I guess this is, you know, an area in American history when the suburbs were becoming increasingly popular for white families. And it, it was just this big big cultural shift, I guess. So, so much so that realtors would create fact sheets about the new white families that were moving <laughs> to the neighborhood. Yeah, that's, that's one of the aspects of the book that I feel like kind of time stamps it as being definitely from the 1970s. We did want to share with you guys a quote from Are You There, Reader? It's Me, Margaret, a reconsideration of Judy Bloom's prose uh, by Joseph Michael Sumners. And he writes, if the 1960s climate of political and sociocultural change created an audience of young adolescent women who felt their needs and desires were being left textually, let alone publicly, unaddressed, Judy Bloom transformed the texts these young women consumed during the late 1960s and 1970s into a literature that spoke to them about difficult issues when no one else would. I can see the real influence of feminism and the women's movement on this text and the idea that 
young girls mm-hmm. should be informed about what's happening with their bodies and that they should not be ashamed of these things, that it should be something that they can talk about in school with their parents, with their friends. I just thought that was really interesting. And it's also one of the reasons why the book was so controversial, because it talked about these um, taboo subjects. Elsewhere in Joseph Michael Summers' article, he talks about the use of the first person narrator and how Bloom's first person narrators, he says, quote, become essentially attractive candidates to invoke and discuss otherwise difficult subject matter with young women and encourage them to reach a self-actualization of their own. Jill Walsh calls the use of this narrative voice a, quote, mask that the author dons as a strategy deliberately adopted to affect her point. As Bloom stresses, she intended for her writing at this point in her career to be both confessional and therapeutic for her and her reader. Um, And Bloom said, writing for 12 year olds has a lot of appeal. When you're that age, everything is still out there in front of you. You have the opportunity to be almost anyone you want. I was not yet 30 when I started. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. But by then I have felt my own options were already gone. Um, which I think is like a really interesting and kind of sad quote, but not yeah. sad because she was wrong, you know, like Judy Bloom at that age, uh, not yet 30, um, still had like a really rich, varied career ahead of her as a novelist. So, yeah. But there is that sad sense that um, women in particular have that there's some kind of time limit on our success. Right. And and this idea of, of this this eleven slash twelve year old girl tapping into this part of kids and also adult readers who want to feel like their options that their world is still wide open. All right. So the next segment that we want to talk about is that aged poorly, where we explore some aspects of the book that feel particularly dated and depressing. One of which is the discussion of weight. Yeah, so as Sarah mentioned, weight is... uh, It's not talked about a lot in this book, not as much as in other Judy Bloom books, but there's a moment, chapter five, where the PTSs are meeting for the first time, and Margaret, our narrator, says, We sat around on the porch, and Nancy brought us Cokes and cookies. When Gretchen helped herself to six Oreos at once, Nancy asked her how much weight she'd gained over the summer. Gretchen put back four cookies and said, Not much. It's really sad. Um, and Poor there's Gretchen. another part. Yeah, first of all, Nancy, mind your own damn business. Yeah, Jesus H. Christ. Back off. I understand God. why Margaret is friends with her because she's new. But yeah, I these wish these girls other... girls have been around for a bit. Yeah, I wish these other girls didn't waste their time <laughs> with Nancy. She's not nice. Yeah, I always thought there was going to be some big moment with Nancy at the end of the book where Margaret was like, all right, I'm done here. But she never does. Like, she definitely sees her differently after the period lie. But there's no, like, real reckoning in their friendship where Margaret's, like, stop being horrible to us. Right. There's another point in the book where Gretchen also says, quote, My mother said now I'll really have to watch what I eat because I've gained too much weight this year. Which (sighs) just breaks my heart to think of a sixth grader being told that. By their mother. Mm. And when you're going through puberty, yeah, when you're you... supposed to gain weight. And uh, yes, and at the point in your life when you have the absolute least amount of control over everything, especially what's going exactly. on with your body. Yeah, just horrible. Screw Nancy and screw Gretchen's mom. There was also a part that I, there was an excerpt of the way that they talk about Laura, who, as we mentioned before, is the girl in their class who has developed much faster than the other girls and so there's a lot of slut shamey stuff around her on page 66 margaret says quote i was afraid to even look at her Mm -hmm. kind of giving the impression that she thinks that her like sluttiness is contagious and on page 146, she says, I hated her for being so big and beautiful and having all the boys stare at her, including Mr. Benedict. Which is just so sad, because obviously it's not Laura's fault at all that the boys stare at her. And also, Laura doesn't have any friends and seems miserable. Yeah, she doesn't... Oh, my God. And also, is it true that Mr. Benedict is staring at her? I That was another thing that I thought we were going to come back to. Like, I thought it would be revealed that, like, oh, he wasn't staring at her, like, 
he <laughs> he was worried about her because she has no friends, you know, or something like that. But is he actually staring at her, or is this just another weird toxic lie? I don't know because I think it's something that's kind of planted in Margaret's head from Nancy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and Nancy obviously doesn't have a firm grasp of reality. Uh, but yeah, yeah it's that. never really clear if he actually is staring at her or if that's just kind of like this paranoia that the girls have. Um, but if it's true, ew. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted something to something to be clarified or done. <laughs> yeah, Laura. there were a few moments in the book where I was like, oh, that's it? We're just leaving that there, you know? Yeah. Anybody gonna check on Laura? Yeah. She okay? Maybe offer her a more sincere apology? That's an idea. Or friendship. That's what else I thought was going to happen. I thought she was going to stop being friends with Nancy and become friends with Laura. Mm -hmm. Because clearly Nancy is kind of a lousy friend. And, you know, Laura is owed, I don't know, um, a deeper characterization than just her her body. But that didn't happen. And that kind of, I mean, it's realistic, you know. I'm, I'm not saying that the book is bad because of it. But it was something that I was really anticipating that we didn't get. And it is... It is sad. Yeah, I agree. I thought that she was going to become a friend. But also, I understand why Laura would not want to be friends with Margaret after how rude Margaret was to her. That's true. Yeah. Um, Another part of the book that feels, you know, particularly antiquated, like we said, is the um, obsession with how bizarre it is that Margaret is not any religion. Because, Mm -hmm. you know... Like, participation in church and organized religion has just continued to decline over the last few decades. Um, So I don't think it's really that unusual for a sixth grader to not attend church or not attend religious functions. But when Margaret tells her friends in New Jersey that I'm not any religion, they're like, they lose their damn minds. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of transitioning into our next segment, Your Fave is Problematic. I guess as a consequence of this book being 50 years old, there's some stuff that necessarily feels outdated, not great, offensive. I found an interesting Washington Post article written by Kathy Hanuer, who the article was called, As a kid, I loved Judy Bloom's book. As an adult, I wonder, how did they read today? And so she's kind of talking about her experience recently rereading these books as adults and what surprised her. And one of the things that she talks about is the parts of the books that definitely would probably get flagged now if they were trying to get published today for being inappropriate, offensive, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, like Indini, which is a book about a girl who has scoliosis and gets a back brace. Um, so it's an interesting book because it talks about addresses disability, which um, especially in the 70s and 80s was not a topic that a lot of children's literature discussed. But there is a character in the story who's referred to as Old Lady Murray, who has kyphosis, or what we then would have called a hunchback. And Deanie says, she's so ugly, she makes me want to vomit. Hmm. And she also is really rude about this girl who has eczema, and she calls it creeping crud. And it's like, okay, afraid that it's going to catch. I have eczema. <laughs> yeah, which is someone with eczema. I take some. It's a little rude. <laughs> a little rude. And I think what we're meant to get from this is that, like, Dini is projecting a little bit. Yeah. And she learns to become less judgmental of these people. And she actually does kind of what happens in Dini that does not happen in Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, is that Dini does actually befriend the girl with eczema and realizes that she was too hard on her. Don't a lot of people have eczema? I mean, it sounds like this girl has really severe eczema. Like, it's like full body eczema. Oh, that blows. I just get it on my hand. And then in in Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, Kathy Hanauer writes about how there's meanness about girls who are overweight and develop early, which we've talked about. In Blubber, there's a brutal, if completely error-realistic, tale of fifth grade bullying with the narrator, one of the lesser bullies. And... She's, she goes on to talk about kind of the different, some of the different issues with some of these Bloom books, like um, the one poor gay teen in Forever is closeted and ends up in a psychiatric hospital, and the dismissiveness with which adults treat kids and teens, which is, of course, part of Bloom's point, now feels dated and disturbing. Um, mm-hmm. 
And then there's Forever, a compelling and veritable information manual. This was once the quintessential romantic first sex book, but today, after Me Too, the boyfriend Michael would never pass muster. He makes moves on Catherine without her verbal consent, cajoles her to undress in front of him even after she says no, touches her breast after promising not to, and calls her a tease. He's never mean, clearly adores her, and is often respectful of real ambivalence on her part, but he's assertive and persuasive as boys were socialized to be then. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I feel like if I were going to be introducing, I don't have kids, but if I were to be introducing <laughs> my kids to these books, I would want to probably contextualize them with conversation or um, more current YA books that I feel like deal with these issues in a way that is better. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I think that two things can be said at the same time, that they were groundbreaking for their time, but don't hold up in all aspects today and both of those things can be true at once right you know they're incredibly meaningful in the canon but there are points where they fall short these are the things we think about when we provide our kids or people we whether there are children or children you work with a, a wide canon yes moving on to our next segment and now a word from us kids which is also the name of the segment they would go in the middle of two Arthur episodes where there'd be like a little intermission with real live kids. Oh, you're such a PBS. <laughs> I am a kid. PBS head. It's very cute. <laughs> when I, well, when I went to Dogo, which is the site that we've used before to find reviews written by kids for kids, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. Very, very popular has 54 ratings and a average of five stars, which is, Pretty impressive. For comparison, Tuck Everlasting had an average of three stars. Disappointing. So, Terry, do you want to read the first review? I would love to. This is from Siri Reads. And I am assuming that Siri is a girl. She says, I truly love this book. I recommend it to middle school or high school girls. It is a funny, touching story of growing up and the extremes we will go to in order to grow up faster. It made me realize that, well, I wasn't alone in wanting to grow up faster. Although it was set in the 60s, it totally holds up and relates to how girls feel now. On a last note, it is not really for boys, but to each their own, dot, dot, dot. It's a little reductive, Siri. And you know what? Siri hits on a point that comes up all the time in these reviews, which is a lot of girls saying, this book is for girls, boys don't read it. I, which I guess comes out of like a... Embar like, <laughs> they can't know we have periods, kind of, like, yeah. thing, you know? The same way you hide a tampon or a pad when you stand up to go to the bathroom, but you know, why not? Yeah, it <laughs> Boys, is. Boys, read the damn book. Read it. It's really funny how embarrassed, how, how important it is to seemingly to a lot of girls that boys don't read this book. I mean, I think generously you could interpret it as like a protectiveness of like, this thing is for girls and it's ours and we don't want you, you know, but I don't mm -hmm. think that's what it is. I think it's like a real yeah. shame. Like, this will gross you out because it's about things that happen to us and we are gross. <laughs> yeah. Our bodies are atrocities. <laughs> Siri, I'm sorry that you were made to believe that your body was shameful. Yeah. I'm also sorry that your name is Siri. That's got to be hard. Yeah. Jesus H. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. But, uh, wow, great review otherwise, Siri. Well said. You have great points. Also, yeah. I love the very conversational way she says, it made me realize that, well, I wasn't alone <laughs> wanting to grow up faster. I felt like she's right here with us. That's very cute. This next review comes from someone whose username is Emily Adron. She says, one day a girl named Margaret was at her ha here house. She decided to go and go see her friend. When she got to her friend's house, she saw a moving truck. <laughs> Okay. This book reminds me of when my friend moved away to another state. I gave this book a five star rating because it talked about God. Five stars. <laughs> oh my God. She touches on so many points and none of them are the point. <laughs> like a good, like 50% of this review is talking about the moving truck. And <laughs> yeah. And to be clear, that happens in the first chapter. Like this is definitely, this was done for school. Yeah. And this is a girl who read the first chapter of this book and the title and was like, all right, got it. 
done and done. <laughs> yes. Emily did not understand the assignment. No. All right. Uh, Lady of the Jury says, This book is really cool, but probably ask permission, permission from parent before reading, as this book is a huge controversy. <laughs> Five stars. <laughs> like, oh, oh, man. I love it. I think that that's really thoughtful of Lady of the Jury to look out for potential readers. She doesn't want you to get in trouble. Kind of reminds me of, like, when you would go on, like, the American Girl website or the Disney website, and they would be like, make sure you talk to your parents. Like, ask your parents if you can go to www.disney.com. And you were like, mind your business. Also, it's a very funny username, Lady of the Jury. It is. Very good. The next user. All right. Boom, zoom. My friend was raving, all caps, about this book, so she gave it to me to read. Now, I at the time did not want to read in my spare time, but when I read this book, that changed. I could not put this book down. I personally love books that I can relate to. This was one of those books. I absolutely recommend this book. Five stars. That's, Good rating, Boom Zoom. That's very cute. Yeah, very positive. Also love use of the word raving. Mm-hmm. In vocab. I think that Boom Zoom hits on a really important part of this book, which is that it's really fun to read, you know, mm -hmm. that it really does feel like a conversation that you're having with this girl, Margaret, and it's pretty well paced and everything. So, yeah, that's a it's an enjoyable book. Nico Q says it was pretty good, but boys don't read it. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Three stars. <laughs> Again, the the protectiveness, the shame of it all. But unless, of course, this is all a very elaborate plot using reverse psychology to get boys to read it. Mm. All right, this next review is um, a little longer. It's from someone whose username is, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Edmodo F seven U T Z P five X X C. Um, they wrote, in the book, Are You Thou God? It's me, Margaret. <laughs> when you see me saying words and it sounds like I misspoke, just know that I'm giving the correct um, pronunciation of the misspelling that the kid wrote. Yes. Uh, they are very important. They add a lot to the atmosphere. Yes. I would say. So in the book, Are You Thou God? It's me, Margaret. It's about a girl named Margaret trying to figure out if she should be Jewish or a Christian. I loved it that Margaret and her friends stuck together and were always there for each other. I don't know about that. Um, yeah, I think that's a slight misreading, but... Anyway, they say, I rated this book five stars because I love everything about it and have no negative reviews about it. In this book review, I'll be telling you a few of the things I loved about it. There were many things that I loved about the book, but one of them is on page four. It says, quote, hey, mom, there's a girl here who wants top no if I can go under her sprinklers, end quote. It may seem odd that I liked this quote. It's because when Margaret just moved, she made a fast friend. I sure wish that it was like that when I moved to my new house. Oh, I know. A next quote that I liked was on page 95. It says, quote, she sent me two postcards a week, called every Friday night, and promised to be home for Easter. End quote. I just really love that sentence because it really shows that Margaret's grandmother really cares about her. And trust me, I have never in my life heard a grandmother call her granddaughter so much. This is getting really sad. I know. Also, please, I need you to pronounce that word correctly. Uh, grandmother. Oh, yeah. Grang, grandmother call their granddaughter so much is how it's spelled. <laughs> That's what really makes me think that she has a strong relationship with her grandma. I love this book because the love... I think that's supposed to be because... I love this book because of the love and care it shows and yet enough drama with Margaret choosing her religion. religion. Recommend this book to somebody who wants the right enough of drama and yet just amazing characters. Isn't that the perfect dream book to read? I sure think so. Five stars. I love this review. I, I would love it if my kids reviewed, but like the quotes, she gives actual, you know, connections to the text. Supporting details, that's what really makes me think that she has a strong relationship with her grandma, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think he did a great job, Edmodo dash F7 UTZP 5 XXC. Yeah, there's like a level nice of work. critical thinking and use of evidence and analysis that is very advanced. All right, Terry, you want to read our last review? 
I don't know if this is pronounced sinew or s new, <laughs> but I'm going to go with sinew, said, I love this book. Margaret is such a bright and kid young lady. Going to school is kidding. <laughs> I got to start over. Sinew, I love this book. Margaret is such a bright and kid kind young lady. Going to school is getting tough for her. I recommend this book for any age, mostly for young, bright kids. <laughs> so you dummies, stay away. <laughs> if you're a dumb boy, don't even think about picking up this book. So moving into our next segment, the book was better. Apparently, there's going to be an Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret film. Woohoo! Woo so, apparently, Judy Bloom has repeatedly rejected several off offers to adapt her book in the 50 years since its publication, but she recently sold the film rights to James L. Brooks and Kelly Fremont Craig, with Craig set to write and direct, and a studio bidding war over the distribution rights was won by Lionsgate. In February 2021, it was announced that Abby Ryder Force... Uh, Fortson would star as the titular Margaret with Rachel McAdams cast as her mother. Kathy Bates, yes, would be added to the cast in March. Is that um, Sylvia? Is that Grandma Sylvia? That has to be slap. Grandma Sylvia. I adore. Plot twist Kathy Bates plays Laura, <laughs> <laughs> the busty sixth grader. <laughs> and in April, Benny Safty would join the cast. I am so excited. I love Kathy Bates. I know it's probably not going to happen, but I really, really want this movie to be set in the 70s. I think that it's, and especially like we said, you know, this, it's not as though kids this age don't, like when I say this age, kids in this decade don't struggle with l religion. Obviously they do. But as, as Sarah said, like that is a, a more, a slightly more dated issue for a child to have this idea of well i have to be something mm -hmm. so also the outfits we would be robbed if they set this movie in the 20s that would be devastating i need a 70s tween flick and i need it now agreed i also think for all of the people of like my mom's generation who loved this book i feel like it'd really mean a lot for them to see it set in the 70s yes you're you're right i hadn't even thought about that that's so sweet yeah do, you can do a lot with the way the various ways in which this story was groundbreaking if you put it in its context in its exactly historical like, context that's how you're gonna make it stick yeah agreed but filming began on april 1st of this year in charlotte north carolina and let me tell you when this baby hits theaters sarah if it is safe <laughs> <laughs> we're going so, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret is, of course, a very famous and popular book, and I could really see its influence on the Alice books, which mm -hmm. is a series of books written by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor that follows Alice. The youngest book, I believe she's in third grade, and it follows her all through high school and then even into adulthood. And... They are very similar, I would say, to Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, in terms of storytelling and themes. Not so much religion, mm -hmm. but definitely about, like, finding a sense of self, fitting in with one's family, puberty. And in the dialogue a bit, too. Like, mm -hmm. just the writing style and the way the characters talk. They're, they both have this as sort of, like, understated humor mm -hmm. that is <laughs> yeah, very authentic and charming. And I feel like a lot of, I mean, so many books like middle grade and YA books that kids read that have a um, a girl protagonist who speaks in the first person. They owe a lot to this book and to a lot of Judy Bloom's books for kind of breaking that genre open. It was interesting as I was doing some research, there was some criticism from critics of Judy Bloom's books who referred to her books as like problem novel, basically being mm -hmm. that like these are books that exist where a problem is presented and then the conflict is just trying to resolve that problem i guess as opposed to a more literary book that comments more on like themes of the human condition in the world i think comparing it to a book like a kid's book like huck finn for example or whatever which has like social commentary and mm -hmm. all of that stuff that this that these books are kind of myopic so yeah i think it's kind of a reductionist and um 
sexist take mm-hmm. the idea that the internal world of a young girl um, is unimportant is unimportant or not complex or nuanced i mean this book does deal with like really big important questions like god i don't know what questions get much bigger than the creator yeah, that of the one's universe pretty hefty yeah yeah like we said i mean this is this book is absurdly famous in so far as like whether or not you've read it you've definitely heard of it it's been referenced by the simpsons uh supernatural family guy <laughs> deadpool <laughs> everyone under the sun would you say that its title is kind of like one of the original memes like yeah you know take it and twist it mm-hmm But because this book has been around for so long and has been reprinted so many times, though, there's this ongoing thing, which I consider a problem, where the covers, I feel, we're getting to the point where they no longer reflect the book itself. One of the most recent ones I saw has, like, text bubbles. Mm. Like, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. And then typing from, I guess, God. And I don't know. I feel like if you're a kid and you pick that up, you would be very thrown off. The cover that I always saw growing up is a very Y2K, early 2000s picture of a girl looking up at the clouds. I'm sorry, but Margaret cannot be represented by a girl wearing butterfly clips because this bitch is so 70s. Like, the loafers without socks, please. Hmm. Like, I want a reprint of the original cover. I would buy that book in a second. So let's talk a little bit about some of the lessons that this book might have for us today. One of the first things I noticed was that you should mind your own business, first of all. (laughs) Just keep to yourself. Don't talk about people you don't know. Don't believe Mm -hmm. gossip. Yep. Don't start rumors. It's all good advice. Make better friends. Jesus Louisa. Yeah, make better friends. And I feel like Margaret hasn't fully figured that out yet. I feel like there's going to be a dramatic falling out within the next two to three years. Oh, yeah. We all know a Nancy. And also, the idea that you can make your own decisions about big, important things, like religion, that that's something that you can come to terms with on your own, and that you don't have to necessarily be able to explain to anyone, Mm -hmm. or justify to anyone. Mm -hmm. Your relationship with God is through um, little convos, then that counts. I used to talk to, not God, but I used to talk to the universe in high school. (laughs) You know, I think that that's uh, an important part of coming to terms with your place in the... I'm making a big circle with my arms right now. (laughs) I don't know what it means, but... Yeah, I agree. One of my favorite parts of the book is when Margaret says, my mother says God is a nice idea. He belongs to everybody. Um, Well said, Mrs. whatever Margaret's last name is. Yeah. Simon. Unless, of course, Margaret's mother is a liberated woman and kept her own last name. (laughs) It is 1970. Yep. Yeah, any other lessons or anything you want to say? Don't have crushes on boys just because everyone else does. Mm -hmm. Go find your own moose. Be nice to first-year teachers. They're trying their best. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're going to give kids a year-long project and let them choose the topic, probably, like, check in with them to see how it's going, because straight up Mr. Benedict does not do that. And as a result, Margaret's project submission is like a piece of paper that says, sorry. Yeah. I was like, did you not ask for any, like, drafts of this? Some planning, a storyboard? I don't know. Mr. Benedict was like, you guys got this. (laughs) See you at graduation. (laughs) Yeah, also, I did notice that I feel like um, Mr. Benedict and Miss Honey would, should get together. (laughs) They're both 24, nervous, sweet, young teachers. Plus, Miss Honey could use the extra income. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she could. (laughs) And as we mentioned before, an adult friend. Yeah, they they could really benefit from that. So lastly, it's it's time to rate this book. So um, (laughs) we are going to rate this book um, out of 1 to 10 Teen Softies. Teen Softies, of course, being the brand of pads that Margaret uses. Mm -hmm. Um, Terry, how many Teen Softies would you give this book? I feel like I default to this number a lot, but I would give this book 7 out of 10 Teen Softies. I thought it was really, really fun to read. I think culturally it is super duper significant. And while it's not my favorite of any of the ones that we are going to read for this podcast, I did really, really enjoy it. Yeah, I agree. I think I'll give it 8 out of 10 teen softies for all the reasons you said. 
So you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at reading underscore recess. You can email us at readingduringrecesspod at gmail.com. And if you like this episode or other episodes, please subscribe to our podcast and you can also leave a review. It helps other people find us. Uh, We'd really appreciate it. So thank you all so much. And all you lying tweens out there, stay reading.